told my wife, don't let me forget my gal. <laughs> I, I hear this. I want to open up the work session and the executive session this morning. And this morning we have some replacements for Legislators, the replacements are for Tom Walkman, Mary Representative Mary Jane Walner, and for Mary Griffin, Representative Lynn Turcott, Representative Doucette, Representative Representative Casellas. Did I say that correctly? And for Representative Bob Elliott, Carol McGuire. We have a total of 18 bills we want to discuss today. We've had caucuses both, uh, from both parties reviewing all bills. And I've talked with the ranking member from the other party see where we stand, and it looks like that uh, we're consistent on about nine bills that we could exec today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and do the executing on these nine bills right away. Then we will discuss the other bills in numerical order. The, the first bill I want to exec, I'm going to hold because I received an email this morning from the DRA, and the DRA asked if it possibly could be amended to make one more change, which is a simple change. It doesn't affect the law. All it affects is the cost of mailing. It's considerable savings if we do this. So Representative Romney graciously left the room over get the amendment done, and it should be brought down to us soon. So I'm going to delay uh, the executive session on House Bill 1063 and go to House Bill 1189, permitting voluntary donations to municipalities or the state to fund certain projects or to reduce taxation. Representative Yuley. Representative Yuli Moore's ITL on 1338. And before you, and seconded by Representative Alney. Too many folders. Seconded by Representative Army, uh, uh, Almy. Representative Yearly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a well-intentioned bill uh, seeking to allow voluntary uh, deductive donations. However, it is a bit redundant in that 
the hush donations are um, already allowed. In addition, the wording to the bill seems to commercialize such donations and may even leave the door open for authorizing entities through ethics charges or favoritism as a re result of donations being made in this fashion. Um, one should also note that some agencies, including the Housing Finance Authority and New Hampshire Library, under their specific RSAs, are already authorized to accept donations. Uh, in a M-A-N-A-T-T -T memo uh, found in the uh, Municipal Association of uh, 2016, the donations of some types in medical fields may complicate Medicare and Medicaid uh, regulations. So that's a, a consideration that uh, this bill needs to take under consideration. In addition, under RSA 3119I, a political subdivision may accept donations for a project. This particular bill doesn't meet the requirements of that piece of legislation because it doesn't designate as to what type of donation is being made and, and uh, the Supreme Court has laid out what the donations have to be and you can also find that in a 2013 Municipal Association uh, white paper. Therefore, uh, this bill uh, should be recommended in expedient to legislative history. Any further discussion on the motion to ITL on House Bill 1189? Seeing no further discussion, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will begin the voting with Representative Patrick Abrami. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Subbing for Mary Griffin, Representative Turcott. Yes. Representative Olery. Yes. Subbing for Doucette is Representative Casale. Yes. Representative Lang. Yes. The clerk votes no. ITL motion. Representative McGuire subbing for Representative Elliott. Representative Janigian. Representative Nunez. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Tudor. Yes. Representative Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Representative Southworth. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Schomburg. Representative Tucker. Yes. Representative Gomarlo. Yes. Subbing for Representative Lofman is Representative Walner. Yes. Representative Gord. Not voting. Representative Hacken Phillips. Yes. Representative Murphy. Yes. And Chairman Major. Yes. Mr. Chair, the vote is 24. There was one scaffold who voted no, and two were not voted. It's 21 to 1. <laughs> vote then 20 to 1. The motion of ITL passes. Without objection, we go on consent. Any objections? And we clear on the consent count. Uh, the next is House Bill 1204. 1204-FN-A-Local, dash dash an act reducing the rate of the meals and rooms tax and increasing the revenue sharing of meals and rooms tax revenue with municipalities. Representative Brahmi. Uh, I move ITL on uh, House Bill 1204. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> I move interim study on House Bill 1204. And do we have a second? Second. By Lang. I mean, Representative Lang. Representative Brown, you want to speak to your motion? Yes. What this bill does is it 
uh, reduces the uh, meals and rooms tax from 8.5% down to 7.9%, but at the same time, it increases the percentage that goes to the municipalities from 30% to 40%. Now, in the last budget, uh, in HB2, they, we, we raised, we just raised the, what went to the municipalities to 30% from what was running in the low 20s for the last couple of budgets. So I, I think, I think with that, I, I don't see uh, us really moving with this and that we should con continue to study this uh, as a committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any further discussion on House Bill 1204? Representative Naomi? Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it would be good on in the blurbs to where it's relevant to mention that we are concerned with the surplus. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, and I'm going to ask the clerk to call the vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We'll begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative Turcott. Yes. Representative Ullery. Yes. Representative Lasalis. No. Representative Lang. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative McGuire. Representative Janigian. Representative Nunez. Yes. Representative Spillsbury. Representative Tudor. Yes. Representative Almy. Representative Ames. Representative Southworth is not voting. Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Schomburg. Yes. There we go, clerk, Mr. Clerk. There we are. Thank you. I've recorded your vote as yes. Thank you, sir. Representative Tucker. Yes. Representative Gomarlo. Yes. Representative Walner. Yes. Representative Gord is not voting. Representative Hacken Phillips. Yes. Representative Murphy. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. The vote being 21 to nothing for the motion of interim study passes. Okay. The last one was 20 to 1. But so without objection, we'll go on consent. We will go on consent. The next will be House Bill 1228, an act relative to the recommendation of the Joint Committee on Dedicated Funds, Representative Bernstein. I would like to motion OTP on HB 1228. Have a second, Representative Almy. Let me speak to your motion. Thank you. This bill repeals various inactive dedicated funds, deposits any remaining funds of repealed dedicated funds into active funds revises the reporting requirements for certain dedicated funds. HB 1228 was requested by the Joint Committee on Dedicated Funds, which was established to review the finances and purpose of all dedicated funds on a five-year rotating basis and recommend continuance, amendment, or repeal of relevant provisions. The Joint Committee on Dedicated Funds sought and received significant input from the affected agencies in order to complete their annual report, which was the basis for this bill. So I encourage you all 
to support the good work of the committee and support the OTP motion. Thank you. Any further discussion on House Bill 1228? Seeing none, I'll ask the clerk to call the vote. Begin the voting with Representative Patrick Abrami. Yes. Representative Turcott. Yes. Representative Olery. Yes. Representative Lasalic. Yes. Representative Lang. Yes. The clerk votes yes. Representative McGuire. Yes. Representative Janigian. Representative Nunez. Yes. Representative Spilsbury. Yes. Representative Tudor. Representative Allman. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Representative Southworth. Is he not voting? Representative Malloy. Yes. Representative Schomburg. Yes. Representative Tucker. Representative Gomarlo. Yes. Representative Wolner. Gorg is not voting. Uh, Representative Hacken Phillips. Yes. Representative Murphy. Yes. Representative Major. Yes. The vote is 21 to nothing. The vote then 21 to nothing on the motion of Opta Pass. It passes and without objection, we put it on the consent. Seeing no objection, so House Bill 20, 1228 will go on consent. The next bill is House Bill 1338, an act establishing a committee to study imposing a tax on manufacturing based on the cost to dispose of single-use products and product packaging materials. Representative Elming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move on ITL on this bill and speak my motion. Representative Elmy moves ITL on 1338. Second. Second by Representative Urley. Representative Elmy. Thank you. On, I've had considerable conversation with the sponsor about this on, and with the, um, the ranking member in the uh, Environment and Agriculture Committee. And they have, uh, we've determined that Environment and Agriculture has and is working in a bipartisan fashion on a major uh, landfill study bill, which includes the concept of on um, producer, uh, I keep forgetting what that, that stands for but producer re extended responsibility on that is that the people who produce things that on um, are difficult to dispose of in landfills or recycling or whichever on um, should be including in the cost of their materials the the um, the cost of disposal and that uh, that uh, bill over in environment and agriculture is going to is being stripped of all reference to the uh, how the costs would be paid and talking only about the technical aspects of how this would be done and how to reduce the the bulk going into our landfills so that we will still have landfills in 10 15 years in this state and um, they, they are open to taking anything from this bill that is new to, to the pro producer extended responsibility concept and including it as part of the study. The sponsor has done some interesting work on single-use products and, 
and prop product packaging uh, use and uh, is willing, as I understand it, to collaborate uh, with ENA on their work. And uh, for that reason, and because this also technically uh, would present a lot of issues if we were to consider it in this committee before the work has been done by ENA on on should be recommended ITL for this term. Thank Rep. you, Senator, Representative Ulrey has an addition. Okay, thank you, Representative Alamy. Further discussion, Representative Ulrey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank the ranking member for her comments regarding this bill. Um, I would hope that the uh, blurb would include that uh, this particular bill, without that basic information, was totally unworkable. And the, uh, the bill didn't make a distinction between component elements of a manufactured product. And uh, that's something you're kind of signaling to EDMA that uh, that particular area needs to be uh, looked at as well. So that uh, um, if uh, my fountain pen has one piece that's not recyclable, does that get counted or not counted? That, that there's just a lot of stuff that needs to be dealt with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you, Representative Early. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then I'll ask the clerk to call the vote of ITL on House Bill 1338. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will begin voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. Turkai. Yes. Ulrey. Yes. Lasalas. Yes. Lang? Yes. Burstein votes yes. McGuire? Yes. Nunez? Yes. Sorry, I went out of order. Janigian? Yes. Silsbury? Yes. Tudor? Yes. Almy? Yes. Ames? Yes. Southworth is not voting. Malloy? Yes. Representative Thomas Schomburg? Yes, Mr. Clerk. Representative Tucker. Go Marlowe. Yes. Walner. Yes. Borg is not voting. Hacken Phillips. Yes. Murphy. Yes. And Chairman Major. Yes. 21 no. The vote being 21 to 0, the motion of ITL passes. Without objection, we'll go on consent. We will go on consent. The next bill is House Bill 1407-FN, an act including the promotion of affordable housing under the Land and Community Heritage Investment Program. Representative Gramalo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, while we all recognize the crisis in New Hampshire with our housing, um, LCHIP is not the avenue. I'm going to make the motion. Oh, I'm sorry. So sorry. Um, I make the motion to ITL. Representative Gamalo makes the motion of ITL, and Representative Spillsbury makes a second that motion. Representative Gamalo may I'm want sorry to about that. the motion. <laughs> oh, while we recognize that uh, the housing crisis in New Hampshire is great, um, we don't. I don't believe LCHIP is the appropriate avenue for a remedy and nor should we take dollars from the general fund. Um, the amendment offered uh, would be best discussed with all, all the stakeholders, and they can bring forth legislation next year with any ideas and recommendations that came from that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Gamalo. Any other comments? Seeing none, then I'll ask the clerk to call the vote ITL on House Bill 1407. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. 
Turcotte. Yes. Ulrey. Yes. Lasalis. Yes. Lang. Yes. Burstein votes yes. McGuire. Yes. Chenigian. Lunet. Yes. Stillsbury. Yes. Tudor. Yes. Almy. Yes. Ames. Yes. Southworth is not voting. Malloy. Schomburg. Tucker. Yes. Go Marlow. Yes. Walner. Gorg is not voting. Hacken Phillips. Yes. Murphy. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. The vote being 21 to nothing on the motion of ITL on House Bill 1407, it passes. Without objection, we'll go on consent and receive no objection. We will appear on the consent agenda. The next bill is is House Bill fifteen hundred dash dash FN dash A, an act reducing the rate of the communication service tax and repealing the tax in twenty twenty five. Representative Moonhead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move interim study. Representative Moonhead moves interim study, seconded by. I'll second that. Representative Urey. Representative Moonhead, you want to speak to your motion? Yes, very, very simply, um, this bill needs more study and. Primarily, we need more info, and we need to study the applicability of this of this bill and, and tax, as as we've got a changing environment in landline, cell phone, and um, I just feel like we need more study on this. So, I think interim study is the appropriate venue for this. Thank you, Representative Moonhead. Any further discussion? Seeing none, then I'll ask the clerk to call the vote of interim study on House Bill 1500. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will begin the voting with Representative Abramian. Yes. Turcotte. Yes. Ulrey. Yes. Lasalis. Yes. Lang. Yes. McClurk votes yes. McGuire. Yes. Chenigian. Lunez. Yes. Stillsbury. Tudor. Yes. Almy. Yes. Ames? Yes. Southworth is a no vote. Malloy? Uh, I'm sorry, is a no vote. Correct. <laughs> Malloy? Yes. Schomburg? Representative Schomburg votes yes. Thank you. Representative Tucker? Go Marlowe? Yes. Walner? Yes. Gorg is not voting. Hacken Phillips? Yes. Murphy? Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. The vote being 21 to 0 on the motion of interim study, it passes on House Bill 1500. Without objection, we'll go on to consent. I see no objection. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Could I just on. mention on Representative Southworth and I believe Representative Gorg are not going to be able to vote during this whole uh, year due to on the commitments that they have outside the legislature that make it impossible to expose themselves to the environment. So on we are not bringing in substitutes uh, in general unless we think that there is are going to be votes that we need to to uh, affirm our entire presence for. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Representative Almy. I hope and pray that this whole pandemic thing disappears very soon. It's not nice. The next bill, House Bill 1525. House Bill 1525-FN-A, an act establishing a county nursing home capital reserve fund. Representative Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I make the motion of interim study on this bill. Representative like Bromney makes the motion of interim study, seconded by Representative Schamberg. Representative Schamberg. Representative Barney, you want to state your motion? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, the bill does set up a, uh, a capital re reserve fund for our county home nursing homes, uh, seeding it with twenty-five thousand dollars this year. Million. Million. I'm sorry. Thank you. A couple more zeros. I put my glasses back on. Thank you. Uh, and then up to additional fifteen million each year, but never to exceed thirty million in the fund. The, the reality is that everybody who testified on this bill was from Sullivan County. And I will, I will recognize that Sullivan County does have a problem and that uh, they, their nursing home needs to be replaced. Uh, but the, the price tag has now gone up to $54 million for the county to do so. Uh, but the problem we got is that all counties have the same issue. The thing, one thing that's unique about Sullivan County is that fi they have the highest percentage of nursing home patients, 56% of any county that is treated. They don't have many independent nursing home beds in, uh, you know, independent uh, nursing homes. And so there's a higher reliance on, on their nursing home uh, for, for this. The problem with the, the bill, though, is once we get into this terrain of, of doing a bill, there really was no other testimony from any other county, any other county executive saying, let's do this bill. It was everybody who testified was Sullivan County. Uh, I think long term, uh, we're going to interim study it, but my suggestion, and I've, I've made this uh, already, is that they just look for an appropriation. Uh, let's not go through developing this capital fund, but let's go through an, just try to get an appropriation uh, above and beyond the budget. To, so, to solve their problem. Uh, but for now, we're just going to, I'm, I'm suggesting that we interim study this uh, to keep it alive, but uh, that, that would be my suggestion. So, so again, I, I think it would be, again, no other county is asking for this. Uh, the, the municipal association, well, they don't really re represent the county. So no one else really came in other than Sullivan County people to testify in this bill. So that that's, with that, I think we hopefully we can interim study this. Thank you. Representative Alamy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe that the head of the uh, county uh, chairs, delegation chairs, uh, who is from my county, uh, sent a letter in about this. Uh, in my opinion, this is a major problem for two counties, and I'm not quite sure why Coas didn't send anybody in, but they have actually a worse monetary problem on this. There are two counties that are at the very bottom of the list in uh, the amount of real estate valuation per capita, and that is Coas first and Sullivan second. Uh, and uh, they really have serious problems with being able to rebuild their nursing homes, especially with the increase in federal regulations on what has to go into that. Um, however, we are in a major, uh, we have major question marks about what our revenues are going to look like by the end of this fiscal year, never mind the next couple. And this is, would be a huge amount of spending uh, 
and has a great deal of uh, vagueness about how much money could go to different counties for what. And we do know that a number of the counties that are better off would be regarding this as an ordinary funding source when they had a small rehab to do. And five million at this point is a small rehab, which is the only thing that's in the bill. So it does need a lot of study and it's going to need a lot of thought, I think, over following years of what we can do to help, especially those two counties, to fulfill the obligation we have put on them for uh, paying for most of the Medicaid costs of their, of their residents when they get too old to survive by themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Elmer. Further comment? Representative Scoville. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, I appreciate the comments of both Representative Fromm and Representative Almy. Um, as uh, the sole representative from Sullivan County on the Ways and Means Committee, I just want to go on record as saying, uh, I understand that creating a reserve fund programmatically to deal with all 10 counties in the state over a span of decades is probably just too heavy a lift. But I think that uh, the need of Sullivan County is severe. For a county of 42,000 population to fund a $54 million a capital uh, bond issue, uh, which would then rest entirely on real estate tax, which already is uh, at or near the highest in the state. So that, for example, Claremont and Charlestown share uh, the distinct position with, say, Berlin of uh, already having uh, an overwhelming real estate tax burden. So I think that uh, our delegation will be looking for an opportunity for one-time surgical earmarked funds, uh, taking advantage of ARPA and other funds that may be available. And I just beg every member who's here, when that comes around, please give us your support. Further discussion, Representative uh, Tucker. Yes, <clears throat> you did such a good job, Representative Spilsbury, uh, <clears throat> discussing Sullivan. Uh, county. Coas County has two nursing homes. We are heavily taxed and have tried to keep up with capital expenditures, uh, but we are in, we have trouble meeting ob the operating costs at the same time that we keep up the capital costs. So that I imagine that we will be very much in the same position within the next few years of coming possibly for a one time. Uh, appropriation. Two nursing homes is a problem and geographically we're so large that it's very difficult to go to one. That however is being mulled by some people as a solution. So I think COAS needs to do its own study and we certainly need uh, legislators who are interested in this topic to study also. So thank you. Further comments or discussions? Seeing none, then I'm going to ask the clerk to call the vote on the motion of interim study on House Bill 1525. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will begin the voting with Representative Abrami. Yes. Representative Turcotte. Yes. Ulrey. <laughs> Salas? Yes. Lang? Yes. Burstein votes yes. McGuire? Yes. Kanigian? Yes. Nunez? Yes. Spilsbury? Yes. Tudor? Almy? Yes. Ames? Yes. <coughs> Malloy? Yes. Representative Thomas C. Schomburg? Yes, Mr. Clerk. Representative Tucker? Yes. Go Marlowe? Yes. Wallner? Yes. 
Hacken Phillips. Yes. Murphy. Yes. Chairman Major. Yes. The vote being 21 to 0 on the motion of ITL, a uh, motion of interim study, it passes. And without objection, we go on consent. No objection, we go on consent. Mr. Chair? Yes. This, I know this uh, new uh, system is a little new for individuals, but we need to maintain a little bit of um, microphone um, discipline. Thank you. I forgot the word real quick. Uh, because if too many mics are on at any given time, not the other mics are not allowed to be used. So it just a reminder to everyone. Yeah, but I, uh, but I have the ability to shut everybody down. <laughs> yeah, that's a bummer. <laughs> and I'll I'll try to. Uh, are you saying that you're a dick? No. no. Okay, the next bill. For exacting is House Bill 1541-FN. An act establishing a deferral from the business profits tax and the business enterprise tax for qualified limited liability startups. Representative Janusian. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I believe that uh, ITL uh, would be appropriate for this bill. I make a motion for ITL. Okay. And President I'd like to speak Jimmy to my motion. Makes the motion by ITL. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Representative Turcotte. Representative Janusian, you want to speak to your motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, this is a well-meaning bill, and its, in, its intent is to help small businesses get started by deferring their any uh, tax burden they may have on the BET, business enterprise tax, or the business profits tax. Um, there already in, in the tax code, um, I believe, allows this in that until a business has reached at least 92,000 in um, business receipts, or 92,000 in, I'm sorry, 92,000 in net would they pay, you know, let me take that back. Until a business has reached 92,000 in receipts, they're not gonna pay the business profits tax. And the business enterprise tax already has a threshold of 207,000 if it's less than 207,000 in gross receipts, then a business would have to have at least $103,000 um, value on the enterprise value um, of the business. So it, those numbers are high enough that small businesses have a chance to, to get started to see um, if they can make a run at it without paying any taxes. So again, I think um, HB 1541 is, while well-intentioned, not necessary at this point. Further discussion? No further discussion. Then I'll ask the clerk to call the vote of ITL on House Bill 1541. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will begin the voting with Representative Pat Abrami. Yes. Representative Turcotte. Yes. Ulrey. Yes. Lasalitz. Yes. Lang. Yes. Bernstein votes yes. McGuire? Yes. Janigian? Yes. Nunez? Yes. Spillsbury? Yes. Tudor? Yes. Almy? Yes. Ames? Yes. Malloy? Yes. The Honorable Thomas C. Schomburg? Mr. Cork, I vote yes. Thank you, sir. Representative Tucker? Yes. Go Marlow? Yes. Walner? Yes. Hacken Phillips? Yes. Murphy? Yes. Chairman Majors? 
Yes. The vote been 21 to 0 for the motion of IGL on House Bill 1541. It passes. Without objection, we'll go on consent. I see no objection. House Bill 1541 will go on consent. Representative Bromley, would you just check and see if that amendment is available on House Bill 16, 1063? Everybody hang loose for a few minutes.
Thank you, Representative Tucker. <laughs> um, opening the executive session back up, we're going to deal with House Bill 1063, an act relative to the technical changes to the administration of certain taxes by the Department of Revenue Administration. We're going to start off uh, with a proposed amendment. Representative Bronder. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move amendment uh, 2022-0300H to House Bill 6, uh, 10, uh, 1063. Second. Oh, right, you're right. I, I reversed. I, <laughs> I uh, retract my motion. <laughs> I, I move ought to pass on House Bill 1063. Second that motion, Mr. Chairman. Motion's been made ought to pass on House Bill 1063 by Representative Romney, second by Representative. Uh, Mr. Chairman, point of order. Yes. Um, were we supposed to talk about the amendment first? No. We're going to talk about it first. Okay. okay. Sorry. Thank you. Right. Just as soon as it's on the floor, then we will talk about the amendment. It's all in this computer. Okay. Uh, Representative Bromney. Uh, Second. Moves it ought to pass on uh, House Bill 1063, seconded by Representative Schomburg. Now, Representative Bromley. Okay, this is very last minute. We just received this uh, in the. You're going to, are we going to make the motion? Make the okay, motion. I move again uh, uh, Amendment 2022-0300H to, amend, uh, to House Bill uh, 1063. And, and so, Okay, Representative Romney moves on to pass and seconded by Representative Almy. Representative Romney. So the, the essence of House Bill 1063 is it's a housekeeping bill by the Department of Revenue. Uh, they, they go through their statutes and they find things that need to be changed. And last minute, I guess they, they caught a few other things they wanted to change and, and it relates to uh, RSA 21-J colon 28-A in section two of the statutes where it looks like they're just changing some wording here. Um, and again, we're all just seeing this for the first time. So uh, I, I would suggest, Mr. Chair, we do have a representative of uh, DRA here who may be able to explain this a little more than I can. But it, it looks pretty straightforward to me. DRA, uh, you want to explain further? Good morning. My name is Keen Ming Wong uh, from Department of Revenue Administration, Tax Policy Council. So this amendment to the bill is basically uh, the, the crux of it is to reduce on the postage charges um, that when we sent out the notices to um, for refunds that was requested by the taxpayers. Um, so what this does is that when taxpayers submit a, um, a request for a refund, if the refund is granted in full, what normally happens um, uh, with the new system is that the notice is sent out, even though if the uh, refund is granted in full, you will still send out a notice saying, okay, yeah, your refund is now approved in full. So, and so this amendment wants to cut out that procedure in terms of sending that notice when the refund is granted in full, and a notice will only be sent out to the taxpayer if the uh, if it's a partial approval or if it was not approved at all. I'll take any questions if you have. Any, any questions? Uh, Representative Almy. Um, so what it actually does is that if the person is getting a full refund, they will just receive the full refund. That is correct. Thank you. Saves about six thousand mailings a year. I don't. I don't have the the, the, the number in front of me, but I'm assuming that's right. Uh, 
Thank I do you. have a question. Any further questions? Uh, yeah. So I recently received a letter from DRA saying that <coughs> they'd made a mistake uh, and that I was due a credit of nine dollars and some odd cents. But the letter started out with the phrase that it was in response to my inquiry. Actually, I had not made an inquiry. And uh, apparently that is, and I, I did call, there was a number, and uh, although I didn't talk with the person who was on the letter, I talked with another representative of DRA, and that's on all the letters. It says this is in response to an inquiry. It was not in response to an inquiry. And this appears that this would make a difference. That I would not have known about this credit if I had not received a letter, even though the beginning was not correct. I now am aware that I need to give that letter to my accountant who will know that I have a credit of $9 and some odd cents uh, for next year. So. Uh, I, you need to make sure that those letters are correct, that the person knows that someone is looking. This was something found by DRA on its own error. Right. I know it's. Um, so I'm trying to see if, uh, if I can answer a question here. <laughs> um, pro probably, um, I think. The reason why those uh, there's a there's a standard verbiage on the letters right now with the new system, um, and that might have been in there for all the letters. So we'll definitely have to go through that and uh, right because this only will work if the person knows there's a possibility mm -hmm. that right there's a refund coming or credit being given, and yeah. if they haven't initiated it themselves, they wouldn't know about it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I hear you. Um, however, this amendment to the bill um, is not in that situation. It's not for that particular situation. Um, this amendment is for uh, taxpayers who are requesting refund, and um, and the notices that goes out for those requests. Any right. other questions? I received this morning from the DRA <coughs> an email for. for Further clarification, let me just read it to you. Currently, when a taxpayer requests a refund or, or credit on their tax return, we are required to send them written notification, both when we grant the requested refund or credit and we deny the requested refund or credit. We would like to send notification only if we are denying in whole or in part the requested refund or credit. This change will prevent the mailing of over 6,000 duplicate letters each year. We believe that the written notice is unnecessary from a due process perspective and we have granted the taxpayer's request in full and therefore no appeal opportunity results. And that's why it only this specific case. Any further questions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's not a question, but I would say that the taxpayer receiving the check would be just as happy that whether or not the letter came. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, then we're we ready to vote on the amendment. Those in favor of the amendment, raise their hands. Those opposed, raise their hands. Unanimous. The amendment passes. Now, Representative Bernstein. I will move for HB 1063, ought to pass as amended. Representative Bromney, I mean, I mean, Bernstein, moves ought to pass with amendment. 
2022-0300H. Second, Mr. Chair. Seconded by Representative Lang. Representative Lang. Thank you. Any further dis discussion or comment on the motion of Bob to pass with the amendment? Can I speak to the motion? Um, Representative Bernstein, you can speak to your motion. House Bill 1063 makes three minor technical changes to the statutes administered by the Department of Revenue Administration. We just heard about the uh, uh, Chairman Major with that and Abrami with the recent amendment. You've heard of the first change. Second, and uh, you're going to want to pay attention because this is thrilling stuff. For business profits tax purposes, current statute directs taxpayers to determine net operating loss using the Internal Revenue Code of 1996. This bill updates the statutes to require the use of in the Internal Revenue Code in effect for the business profits tax, which is currently the Internal Revenue Code of 2018. This change will not result in a meaningful difference in the amount of NOL permitted, but will relieve taxpayers of the onerous task of using a version of the tax code that is 25 years old. The final change, due to systems upgrade, you can now electronically file your research and development tax credit application. House Bill 1063 modernizes the language of the relevant statute by replacing the word postmarked with filed. The term filed is consistent with other DRA administered statutes. I encourage you to vote yes on the OTP A. Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll Representative Hack and Fect Phillips. Um, I think there was a, an additional change to the meals and rooms tax, just updating it um, from 9% to 8.5% as well on page 2. Mr. Chairman, it's where the 9% is removed so that every time we change the tax rate again, they won't have to change this. Right. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the vote on ought to pass as amended with Amendment 0300H. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We will begin the voting with Representative Patrick Obrami. Yes. Representative Turcott. Yes. Ulrey. Yes. Lasalis. Yes. Lang. Yes. Burstein votes yes. McGuire. Yes. Janigian. Yes. Nunez. Yes. Spilsbury. Yes. Tudor. Yes. Almy. Yes. Representative Ames. Yes. Malloy? Yes. Representative Thomas C. Schomburg? Yes, Mr. Clerk. Thank you, sir. Representative Tucker? Yes. Gomarlo? Yes. Walner? Yes. Hacken Phillips? Yes. Murphy? Yes. Chairman Major? Yes. It's a real nail biter, Mr. Chair, 21 to nothing. Thank you, Representative Bernstein. We the motion about to pass with the amendment passes with a vote of 21 to 0 on House Bill 1063. Without objection, it will go on consent. No objection. House Bill 1063 will be on the consent calendar. Now, I have one other bill that had an open question, but the question seems like it was answered this morning, and that's on House Bill 1430. Representative Almy, that, that was the question that you had asked on House Bill 1430. Do you think that you... Uh, Oh, 
only you and I at this point have got the response from Carolyn Lear because I just copied it to you and she just copied it back to you and me. So okay. I could read off <coughs> that or... Okay, we're going to save it for a work session. Then we are through with execing on bills in the possession of ways and means. And we will continue the, with a work session on the remaining nine bills. And we will do them numerically. And the idea is to identify on each of these remaining nine bills what is the more information we need to make a decision. Do we need to, or do we have enough to make a decision? Do we need to make an amendment or anything else? So we'll go to House Bill. 1097 relative to taxation of income of New Hampshire residents in working remotely for an out-of-state employer. Mr. Chair? Oh. You want to start conversation now? Right. Is it you? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Representative Braun. Um, this, this bill was put uh, submitted uh, because of the, what Massachusetts had done during the peak of the uh, pandemic, where they changed their rules and they, uh, in Massachusetts, where if you worked in, in, in New Hampshire, uh, you, uh, you work with a company that sometimes you, you go into the office in Mass, sometimes you work at home. A portion of the time you work at home, you were never taxed. We prorate the, the amount, uh, you, you only get taxed a mass tax when you're in, in Massachusetts physically working. They changed their law during the pandemic to say, during their state of emergency, that that would no longer apply, that, that people working in, in, at home with offices in Massachusetts would have to pay the mass tax 100%. So this bill appears to say we you know, we want to prevent that from happening in the future. Uh, well, actually, the future, the, the sponsor thought it was still in place. We found out since the, the hearing that the Massachusetts state of emergency is, has been lifted and that this um, executive order had also been lifted. So there'd, there'd be no direct impact of us passing this bill on current employees that are working at home because that's been lifted. Uh, the question becomes for the committee, do we see any value here in passing this anyway for future situations that come up? And I, th I think that's the point of discussion that we're we need to have. So I I'll leave it at that for the moment. Any response to Representative Amanda? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, as a co-sponsor of this bill, um, we I do recognize that currently it is not needed. However, there's nothing stopping Massachusetts or any other state from imposing something like this in the future. And I think it's, it's still necessary for us to pass this so we protect New Hampshire citizens. Thank you. And Representative Spillsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, like others, I was upset by Massachusetts uh, unilateral action. Um, and I think the state does, in fact, have an interest in protecting its residents against attacks on uh, work performed in New Hampshire. The problem with the bill as it's drafted is it's purely exhortatory. It just simply says to Massachusetts or any other state, don't do that. But there's nothing enforceable about it. And I think perhaps an amendment that redirected it slightly would be more constructive. So, for example, I think there are two elements that could be helpful in the event uh, that a state does the same thing in the future. One is a clear statement 
of state interest so as to underpin a claim of standing before a court. And second is perhaps an instruction uh, to the executive branch or the attorney general that when such a situation arises, they have an obligation to um, engage in litigation. So we understand that the United States Supreme Court declined to hear the case. Uh, this is not a situation where they remanded it to a lower court. It's a, it's a rare example of original jurisdiction, which gives them the discretion to hear cases between states. And I think that there was political pressure on the court not to hear it. And I think they didn't want to take up a case that they didn't feel that they had to resolve. I do think, though I don't recall that it was stated in the Supreme Court's opinion, that a key underlying procedural hurdle was standing. What is the standing of the state of New Hampshire to assert the claim for harm to individual wage earners? So my question is this. As written, I don't think it's worth passing. Can we revise it? to focus on standing and on instruction to the Attorney General to actually wage the battle. Representative Neurley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the point that was just made seems to be the, the, the crux of the matter, as to give the state standing over actions by other states. We ran across this earlier uh, to a lesser, well, actually to about the same degree, with the interstate sales tax uh, activity. Uh, this falls into that same category. Um, the state didn't have in place a strong enough position. And I believe this, this uh, bill is uh, a vehicle for that to get done. I think it's up to this committee to come up with a uh, strong position, and I think we can get some guidance from the Attorney General. Thank you. Representative Albert. Thank you. Uh, this is about income taxation, and on there are a number of states that on um, reach deep into the pockets and and cities that reach deep into the pockets of people who don't live in those places. Uh, but but work there. I think it's probably, well, it, I don't think it's quite the same as the sales tax one. I would really like to get a good discussion with the Attorney General about on um, what can be done and what's feasible. Um, Representative Ames, and followed by Representative I guess my uh, request for work to be done in this study is, uh, not study, it's a work session, is um, similar to Representative Almey's, uh, but a little different. I, I'd like to, uh, I, find, I find the language here um, uh, very broad, and I want to be sure that what's wrapped up in any language that's the subject of a bill like this is clear. So I would uh, want to have from uh, DRA um, information. I'd like to have a, a report or a discussion with DRA on the um, taxes that we, we apply, that we have, the BET and the BBT particularly, to ensure that we're not uh, shooting ourselves in, in the foot, so to speak, and, uh, and perhaps uh, saying that some aspect of our tax that may indeed reach uh, uh, services that are physically performed in another state. Um, uh, and to take away our power to tax uh, in, implicitly contradict the position we're taking with our tax laws. So I, I'd just like to be sure that we're not uh, on both sides of this question. Representative Romney. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just, I'm, I'm concurring that we, we need the guidance of uh, the Attorney General's office on this one. I think it would be helpful to find out who the point person was in the Supreme Court case that that wasn't really heard, but I'm sure they're the most familiar with this. So if we can de determine who that is, that's probably the person we want to talk to. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're fortunate this morning. We do have somebody from the Attorney General's office. Would you? We would like that. We'll set it up in a call work session. Any further discussion on what we need to uh, get more information on? Then we will have a work session on this, and hopefully you could provide that information so that I'm scheduling this for a work session next Wednesday. Thank you. The next bill is House Bill 1221-FN, relative to the rates of the business profits tax and business enterprise tax. This bill reduces the rates of the business profits and business enterprise tax for tax years ending on or after December 31st, 2023. Members of the committee, uh, do we need additional information on this? Mr. Chair. Representative Urey. I spoke to the uh, sponsor of this bill of representing Nader, and uh, she would be very happy uh, if we had a uh, uh, work session on this bill. If we get any, any further information, that we may need. Okay. And, uh, does anybody have any suggestions on what kind of information they need? Projections, uh, some inf uh, information as to why it applies both uh, only to the BPT and not the BEP, or is the offset continued in into this bill? Okay. All right. Mr. Chair, I don't think that should be a, a long, uh, drawn-out discussion. I think that's uh, information that if we just sit down uh, where we have some open time, we can go ahead and uh, uh, review that and come up with a, a decision on our own. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> Representative Almy? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. Representative Bronner. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I think the information we need is going to come too late and that we need to really know what's going to happen in April and, and beyond uh, because that's when most of the filings happen and we have concerns about the PPP refunds whether how many are there going to be a lot of refunds or not and the credit carry forward issue is a big one that we really won't know so I mean absolutely let's have the let's have the, uh, the work session on it but those, there's some pieces of the puzzle that we, we still don't know as to how, we, how are we really doing right now uh, because of the concern about more about refunds this, this April filing. Thank you. Representative Elmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The um, 90 to $100 million that we may have to be giving back in March, April, on for PPP taxation that was done last year is only the most firm of our worries. We don't know what market-based sourcing switch is, is going to do to our returns. On next year, uh, we're going to be doing starting single sales factor impact on our revenues. That's extremely volatile and it 
seems likely that it would reduce the BPT because we export a lot more on, than we consume in this state. And so we're, if we're switching to only in-state sales we, uh, and ignoring property and ignoring uh, payroll, we may be losing big time. We don't know. Uh, then there's the credit carry forward. And then there's the economy, which uh, is going to be losing a fair amount of federal oomph that was keeping on pushing it on uh, and is going to have to be reacting to inflation and is still reacting to Omicron. Um, I, I, am, I think that a lot of us are severely worried by how much surplus we'll have left in June, never mind next year. And the Finance Committee, in its wisdom, had, had uh, limited the reduction in those tax cuts this last time in order to be able to pass a budget that made sense to them. So um, I really think that it's going to be very difficult for us to have enough foresight to figure out whether we could afford to do this without having to raise something else next term. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I look at this, I, I, I agree. We, we need to be careful because we, we don't know uh, how things may change, and we also have to, um, the credit carryover certainly is, a, is an issue to be cognizant of. One of the things that I'm, I'm thinking, and I'd like to definitely hear from uh, GRA in a work session, is possibly splitting this out. Because when I look at the revenue projection or revenue loss projection, um, it's, it's the BET that has the much bigger impact here um, at about, according to this chart, 27 million um, by 2025, 27 million less. When I look at the BPT, business profits tax, it's about, their projection is about $8 million less uh, by 2025. And so maybe we split this out where we, we keep the BET where it is at 0.55 but we potentially lower the BPT from 7.6 to 7.5. And the thought there is not only is, is the change much less, but when, when, when companies think about, I mean, part of the strategy here is lowering the BPT and BET to have business, encourage businesses from, from other states or just people start businesses they're going to, most of the time, they, they look at it and they say, gee, what's the business profits tax? Because not a lot of other states have something called a business enterprise tax. That top line number is compared quite often. So I think it's an advantage for New Hampshire to, to say we have a 7.5% business profits tax. And let's leave the BET as it is in the current law at 0.55. So my proposal would be we look at just lowering the BPT. But... I agree. I'd like to hear from GRA and get some more information as well. Further questions or comments? Mr. Chairman, if we were going to consider that, I think that we would need the B, uh, the GRA to recalculate how much each of uh, how much that loss would be. And uh, I, I for one, do not believe that this minor tax reduction on the BPT or, in fact, any of the ones that we've been doing uh, has an effect on uh, bringing in businesses to this state. So, in general, I'm opposed, but thank you. This whole business of tax reduction <coughs> is something that not clear. We don't really know what's going to happen. You know, w right now we're sitting in the rainy day fund with a couple of hundred million dollars. But in that rainy day fund of a couple hundred million dollars, there's 
the credit carrier forward. Credit carrier forward is like $275 million. That's not our money. It could disappear. They could, you may have to give it away right away. In addition, there's a, about $100 million in the PPP that we're going to have to give back because we, we were taxing it before we said we're not going to tax it. There's another thing is that our revenues are looking great. And why are they looking great? They're, they're looking great because of all the stimulus that has been put into this over the last two years. They've kept all of our businesses alive. And when you keep them alive and you don't have the expenses because the government's paying for them, you're going to make a profit. That profit is going to go away. Part of it's going to go away after the stimulus is all stopped. Because you can't pro provide the stimulus all the time until somebody pays for that stimulus. So we have to figure out all the tax cuts that we've done so far need to settle down and see what happens before we start adding more tax cuts to it. And I think that's why we need to go look at this more deeply in a work session. So, Representative Lyon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think, and I apologize, I haven't been around a lot much in this committee, but I'm, I'm available now. But uh, the revenue projections that we look at, and, and the ongoing revenue projections, I think, play a big part in this. As you said, you know, we know we have IND tax cuts coming along the line down the road and a lot of other things. So I think looking at this thing as a big picture and not through a straw is extremely important. So as we're moving forward, I'd, I'd like us to see is look at those, uh, have the LBA do, you know, give us our budget projections out for five or ten years and look at, you know, the what-if scenarios. What if we drop this? What if we do that? So we can see what that looks like. Um, I think that's extremely important to understand tax policy as a whole for the state. Thank you. Uh, you remind me. That, that's why starting Friday, we have a full day of economic briefing. And on this Friday, uh, we have a full day of economic briefing starting this Friday. And this Friday, we'll hear from the LBA. And they'll go over all the time all the taxes that they have, uh, how they've been, and where we are, and hopefully give us some projection. We'll do the same thing with the DRA, and then we'll hear from housing, we'll hear from uh, labor, and, and others. We may get tired of it, but then the following Friday, we'll do the same thing, but we'll do it with economists, so we'll find out how the economy's been, how it is now, and what's projected in the future, nationally and regionally, and how it will affect New Hampshire. And we will redo some of these things later on after March and April when the big revenue months come in. So we'll have a better handle on, gee, we can separate the PPP and the stimulus and look at the regular revenues coming in. We don't have that information yet. But we're going to work at it. Any further comments on House Bill 1221? We're going to go to a work session on 1221. The next is House Bill 1430. 1430. 1430, an act repealing the tax on rentals of motor vehicles under the meals and rooms tax. And Representative Almy had asked from, for some information from DRA. We received that information this morning, and we'll be able to go through that on the work session. Uh, 
the next is House Bill 1450. Chair, I think that at that meeting, the uh, American Car Rental Association also wants to speak. Yes. Okay. And anybody that would like to speak, make themselves available, because this has been put into this week's calendar uh, that we're having a work session on these specific nine bills next Wednesday. The next is House Bill 1450-FM, an act including agricultural resources under the Land and Community Heritage Investment Program. What kind of new information do we need on this bill? Comments? Uh, Representative Lang followed by Representative Tucker. Mr. Chair, as I remember the public hearing on this, and we heard from, I, uh, I believe it was the uh, Chairman of Ag Commission of Agriculture, that this is already covered, and that there was really no need to change the law, that under natural resources, they, they consider agriculture and farming. So I'm not sure what new information we would need to get. It was pretty clear, even from uh, the uh, people from LCHIP, that this was also um, that they, they do already put into conservation log ag agricultural tracts. So I'm not sure that there is any more information we really need to get for this, and maybe an ITL motion would be appropriate. Okay. Representative Tucker. Well, if, if we are going to look into the idea of agricultural resources being protected, I think it would be important to know how many land trusts in New Hampshire have directed themselves towards preserving agricultural resources. My impression is that it's a lot, but um, I, it would be a good idea to find out how many land trusts there are that are uh, trying to preserve our agricultural resources in the state. In other words, there, there are other organizations other than LCHIP that are directing themselves to this. Are you working on that? I can try to find out, just send out. But I think it's quite typical. But I, so, uh, perhaps so this is something like the Society for the New Hampshire Protection of New Hampshire Forests will actually know how many land trusts are available who are working on this. It looks like this is the only issue that's holding this bill up. Well, if th if that's the only issue, let's um, we can find out some other time. But if if it's ready to move, uh, that's that's fine too. Okay, then we should be able to deal with this at our work session. Great. Yeah. Now, Mr. Representative Chairman, the, this bill had two parts, and the other one is taking more money from general and education trust funds to LCHIP. So. Um, I'm not in favor of that myself because we don't know what our finances are. And I think that finance itself ought to be dealing with that. But Do you know of anything that where we would need additional information in order to be protected in this bill? No. Okay. Representative Vallmi. Yes, I, I agree with uh, Representative Vallmi. Uh, it does take money. It, it does require an additional quarter percent be taken out of the uh, real estate transfer tax. And that, that amounts to about $506,000 annually. Based That was based on last year's, what we knew the transactions were. Uh, and it was a pretty high year in terms of housing transactions. And uh, in terms of the re revenue, it was pretty high. So, you know, and 33% of that uh, $506,000 would go to education and 67% will go to general fund. So I'm ready to go on this, but I'm willing to wait and, and you know, have a work session on it. But but I, I don't know what we're going to resolve there. I think it's either either we want this or we don't. But thank you. If we don't have any new information, we will be executing this next Wednesday. House Bill 1478. To, relative to the business profits tax applicable to certain large, low-wage employees. 
and Representative Lyon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, again, at least if I recall the public hearing on this bill, it was there was bipartisan consensus, bipartisan consensus that uh, this bill was unconstitutional based on the equitable um, and proportional clause of our Constitution. And I'm not sure what new information we need beyond that to just ITL this bill. Anybody else? Uh, a, a question, Shando. Mr. Chairman. Representative Lang, uh, who is the authority that this is a unconstitutional uh, 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 direction that we would be taking? Sure, absolutely. Susan Almy agreed with me. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I, I don't believe I was quite that definitive about it. <laughs> I think on, and on my explorations on this have been that we really wouldn't know until we took it to the court whether it, it was likely to be considered unconstitutional or not. Um, but also there are um, major changes that would be, need to be made to make this bill work, as at this point, it looks like if you are a multinational with a company in Honduras which is paying less than $15 an hour, that you would have to pay the higher tax in New Hampshire, uh, even if it was constitutional, um, or or you're paying $15, $14.10 to somebody in Texas who is cleaning bathrooms, uh, that you would be have to pay the extra tax in New Hampshire. Uh, and I think it would need a fair amount of work if we wanted to go forward with this. Uh, my view is that this is something that belongs in the Labor Committee, dealing with minimum wages. But uh, there is dispute in my side of the clock of the committee. Unless somebody can come up with something we really know we should be ready for exactly. Representative Brown. Yes, I, I want to I want to concur with uh, Representative Almey. This is really a, a labor bill um, that's disguised as a ways and means bill. That's the way to phrase it. And I think uh, I'll just talk. I'll speak for our caucus. Uh, we, we don't think this this bill is is ready for prime time. Thank you, Mr. Ch Representative Early. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Almy was kind when she was uh, chair to uh, get uh, Professor Hearn to uh, put together a, a, a little brief on uh, equitable and proportional. That would be your expert on that. And uh, in reading his, or rereading his little um, brief, yeah, this doesn't do it. In addition, the sponsor of the bill named businesses to be discriminated against. And mm -hmm. you can't do that in a bill. You can't do that in any law. Representative Turcotte. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as a member of the current Labor Committee and on my third term there, um, this is obviously a, a backdoor attempt at a minimum wage bill. And I would uh, be very in favor of an ITL motion on this bill. Thank you for your comments. Representative. I agree with Representative Turcott. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have some work to do next time to get some more bills out the door. The next is House Bill 1494, relative to the property tax exemption concerning certain communication services or leases. Representative Brownman. Yes, I, I thought it'd be valuable to hold this bill uh, for work session. Um, I reached out to uh, James Jerry, from who is the director of municipal and property division of the Department of Revenue. And he's willing to come in and, and talk to us about the ramifications of this bill. So but we have somebody who will come in and talk to this bill. So thank you. Representative Lyon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I, uh, this was, was this the bill that was talking about broadband? I'm trying to remember if this yeah, was the yeah, one. Yeah. 
So my concern with this bill was giving a broad-based, widespread tax break with the idea that it would be used to help the last mile conversation. Um, by giving them the tax break, they would reinvest back into the broadband to do the last mile conversation. The problem was there were no actual provisions in the bill to make them reinvest for the last mile. We'd just be giving a tax break without a benefit of actually expanding broadband within our communities. Um, and, and then you would look at communities like Manchester, which necessarily don't have uh, very many places where you can't get broadband, and you look at communities up in Coas County, which has a lot, but we'd still be giving a tax break to Manchester while Coas County has no ability to expand broadband. Um, I, I did bring up uh, a general idea of making this enabling statute to allow a municipality to be able to enable a tax break locally and use and do a kind of a pilot program where uh, the broadband uh, providers could say, hey, look, if you give us this tax break, we'll agree to, to invest that much money back into your community to expand. And then it would be a local enabling, enabling uh, provision, right? So if a, my community has problems with, with broadband, the last mile conversation, we could choose to extend a tax break to our carrier and say, hey, look, we're going to give you a tax break totaling $150,000. We want you to do $150,000 worth of infrastructure upgrade. And we'll trade you that tax break for the upgrade to help our community. Um, and I, I don't know whether anybody's interested in doing. Uh, I'm happy to take the on to do an look to see do an amendment to allow that enabling statute to allow local communities to be able to waive this tax locally, and but only in favor of doing basically a trade with the with the provider. Otherwise, I think it's just a tax break. Uh, you make a good point. Uh, would you put together an amendment? Absolutely. Thank you. Anything else? House Bill 1494. Mr. Chair. Oh, yes. <laughs> Over in the Representative corner. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I think it might be worthy to have DRA produce some sort of analysis about what kind of fiscal impact this might make. Uh, it'd be worthy to just review that information, I think, if we're in consideration of the bill. I don't know. I don't know. I. That was something that I think was brought up during the original testimony, and it might be worth checking out. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody who's interested in helping or having a conversation about that amendment, feel free to reach out to me. All right. Representative Bromley. Yes, uh, Representative Hackham Phillips. Yeah, I, I think we should do that. Now, when I call, to set that up, I'll, I'll see if they can quickly put something together. We were handed something out by the, by uh, an assessor, Sansusi's company, which, but it was just for his his towns, not not all the towns and cities. So, um, yeah, I think it'd, it'd be interesting to see what the what the impact would be on all all towns, the 200 plus that we have in cities. Thank you. The next, yes. Representative. I'd just like to express interest in Representative Lang's amendment, uh, being one of the San Susi towns there, which I hadn't realized he was doing ours now. Um, it, the towns at this point have very little leverage against the cable companies to get them to do on. Uh, to do upgrades for the parts of their towns that don't have access at this point, which there is a mile long stretch between Lebanon and Hanover, which they kept in the dark <laughs> and which we haven't been able to do anything about. Um, but on um, this would give, give individual towns that were really concerned with this some leverage if they want to use it. I think it's a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll take care of it. All right. The next is House Bill 1509 relative to the termination of the FRM Victim Contribution Recovery Fund.
Representative Yuri. I would like to hear from the Attorney General as to the status of that, how it operates, what it, how it's broken down, um, whether this does or does not uh, make whole, uh, or and what actions the executive branch has taken to correct the deficiencies that were pointed out both by the SEC, the Banking Commissioner, and within their own office regarding the handling of the uh, the issue. Well, we have somebody from the Attorney General's office. That button. Okay. Yeah. Hi. I'm uh, Tom Donovan. I'm the director of charitable trusts at the Attorney General's office. Uh, we don't usually show up at uh, Ways and Means, so um, thank you for uh, hosting us uh, this morning. Um, uh, the reason I'm speaking is because um, RSA Chapter um, 359P assigns to the director of charitable trusts the responsibility to hire a uh, Administrator for the FRM Victims Compensation Fund. Um, the uh, that fund began. The legislation was first enacted in my, in 2016, and then in uh, 2021 there was an appropriation made of 10 million dollars for that fund. Um, and so it was with that appropriation um, that we were able to then go out and hire someone. That person began work in November. And um, last week, we uh, sent out the applications for compensation. Under that, there was a news release as to that, and that's up and uh, running right now. So that's the process. We're following what the legislature has told us to do in RSA 359P. This bill, um, um, HB 1509, would uh, terminate that fund. That's a policy matter for... Um, uh, for the legislature to consider. I'd note there's another bill, uh, I think it's in the Judiciary Committee, HB 1235, which would fold the um, FRM Victims Compensation Fund into the victims, crime victims compensation system. That's in a different committee. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, Representative Yuri. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there was quite a lot of controversy at the time this bill was heard. There was a, um, a traumatic situation in the uh, governor's council with the uh, resignation of the of a commissioner. Uh, there was uh, some complaints by the SEC, and there was some pointed out, at least in the press, some quote unquote deficiencies in the um, in your own office. Uh, could you give us some information about what is being done to correct those? So, Representative Eulery, all of that happened before uh, my time at the Attorney General's office. I wasn't saying it was you. And uh, I'm just saying um, I'm here to speak to um, the uh, uh, fulfilling what the, legislator, uh, the legislature uh, um, set forth in, in the statute. And that's, uh, is there some way you could get somebody from your office to come in next Wednesday to answer questions proposed by Representative Yuri. So you're asking about questions about things that happened a decade ago. Um, um, I don't know, um, but I will go back and ask. But you're asking uh, things that go back in time. Representative Thank you. Um, I think that this bill does not really require going back and figuring out, trying to figure out yet again who was wrong about what, which I remember wasn't really re completely resolved at the time. Uh, but um, I think that the legislature had a fair amount of of voice in the mess that was created at that time. Um, but what I would like to learn is your 
how your process is going to work since it looks like you have to wait until you think you have all of the applicants for the fund before you can distribute any money. Correct. There's a deadline that was set forth in the statute. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't want to misstate, I'm not mindful of it, that it's in May, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and we've reached out to the mailing list that we have of uh, potential claimants. And um, there are other people in the victim's community that have contacts as well. So the administrator will be um, continuing with reach out in that regard. There's plenty of time. There's plenty of time to distribute all of the money before this bill would repeal it. Well, the <laughs> interestingly, the um, the current um, statute says that the on December 31. So nothing is going to be distributed until December 31 of this year. Yes, it's it the way it's written. It's like it can be made on December 31 of each year. Okay. Um, I, I think that uh, is a partially reflective of the original funding stream. Now there's a $10 million that's been appropriated. If you recall, prior to 2021, um, this fund was to be uh, sourced from donations. So I think there may have been some thought that money would trickle in over years. Um, I envision that um, that this work can be completed, um, and so the distributions could be made on December 31 of, of this year, but the statute does contemplate it could go on, and it would be then December 20, 31 of the following year as well. Mr. Chairman? Follow up. Follow up. Um, so will, by December 31, will you have both tranches, the $10 million? Uh, yes, Representative Almy was referring to the fact that um, the um, 2021 amendment uh, appropriated five million as of last June, uh, July one or June 30, and then the second um, tranche, if you will, uh, will come in in June 30th of 2022. So there will be a full 10 million dollars as of that would be available at that point. So you would be sorry. Follow up. You would be capable of distributing all the money before the deadline for this bill to repeal. Uh, yes, uh, but I, I'll put an asterisk on that because there's um, there are, there are formulas in there. It depends on how much it's claimed, mm -hmm. and then um, the amount of compensation that is available is fifty up to fifty percent. Um, so I. I don't know how uh, it would be speculating for me to predict whether the full $10 million would be um, uh, subject to distribution. Thank you. So uh, could, could I just, one last follow-up, could I ask, can you find out <coughs> from someone in the Attorney General's office whether on there is any state that has ever reimbursed investors without losing a lawsuit in similar kinds of cases? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I could ask. I'm not sure if uh, I would uh, take the answer to the bank, though. Okay. Uh have a number. Representative Ron, uh, Romney, followed by Representative Tucker, Representative Newey, and Representative Ramos. Tucker, go ahead. Okay, Representative Romney. Okay, thank you. Uh, my concern is that this is a classic bait and switch. I, I, know, I think this is a really bad look if we, if we pass this bill. Uh, but I, I have a question for Representative Walner. You're the minority leader in the, in, in, um, over in finance. 
Um, obviously, it this this was my understanding that this was in House Bill Two. Um, I, my question is: Was that how hard was this debated in how and, and finance? Can you recall? Because none of us really knew about this <laughs> until we voted the budget. So it, it was it's in there. Uh, was it? Did it come in as another bill that became part of our bill too? Can you recall? I think it, it did come in as a bill, and then um, Division Number One held the bill and it stayed in the bill. It, oh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It came in as a separate bill. I can't remember the number of it or much about it, but then Division One held that bill, and then it rolled into House Bill Two. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't That's really have my a memory. Someone else may have a different okay. memory. Does anybody, oh, Rep no. Rep Representative Mueller is followed by Representative Ames. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, the recurring question, and uh, I think we can get some of that information that uh, Representative Almy asked from uh, Ask OLS Research uh, as regarding other states, but this fund in no way makes whole any individual investor, does it? So this, uh, Representative Ullery, the statute uh, creates a formula um, and uh, there is debits and credits to it and at the end there's a claim amount and then uh, the maximum that can be distributed is 50% of that claim amount. All right. I've could you provide the committee with a, a, a chart or graph of the, the, that the flow chart of how that formula is created, operates? It's, it's right in the statute. Um, it, the, the legislature created the form, actually. It's, it's quite unusual. So um, I, I'm not trying to dodge your question, Representative Ullery, but it's right in three, RSA 359P. Uh, thank you for, for that uh, information. Um, is there any way that you could get uh, someone from your office uh, to, to help advise this uh, uh, committee uh, since we deal with uh, finances along with Representative Walner's committee as to what is being done to prevent a recurrence of this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Ames. Thank you. Uh, my question goes to uh, what part of the information that you're going to be dealing with and producing will be public. Uh, we're dealing with individual names and uh, amounts. Uh, there'll be a, an amount applied for and there'll be an amount distributed. Uh, assuming this goes through and is not somehow short-circuited by this bill. Um, so uh, what will the public know? And yeah. Uh, Representative Ames, that's a good question. We haven't uh, come to a conclusion on that. The statute requires that um, claimants provide um, tax return information, um, uh, which is typically not public and may be exempt from the right to know law. Uh, but I would imagine that the distribution amounts uh, certainly would be subject to right to know. The names and, and any distribution amounts would be. Thank you. Representative Spillsbury. Sir, if I ask, ask Spillsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I was listening with interest to the exchange between Representative Almy and uh, the AG's rep uh, regarding dates. Speak into your mic. Sure. So, <clears throat> you know, on an initial reading of this bill, I understand it to be uh, an effort to reverse the provisions that were incorporated into HB2, and I personally am not interested in revisiting that and uh, would, not, would not vote for that. But uh, the second provision is essentially just a sunset. So I'm curious. Even if Section 1 was dropped, and therefore we would not be re 
reversing the decisions uh, the legislature made in, in HB2, is there a value in having a sunset provision in light of what you were saying about these ongoing annual uh, and potential donations and December 31st payments? Um, so first of all, we're not taking a position on this bill. This is a policy matter. So the Attorney General's office is not taking a position on uh, uh, HB 1509. Um, there is a provision in the current legislation for um, sunsetting of, of whatever is left over uh, in the current legislation so that if there is money left over at some point um, and it's a few years away, um, and I, I don't want to quote, but it's several years away uh, before it would be, uh, the money would lapse, whatever's left over in that fund. Okay, so there, there is a provision that would sunset it, but it's out in the future. Correct. Okay. Representative Fairfax. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to clarify, somebody had asked a question uh, about the original, where this FRM, uh, how it got into HB2. It did come across in the original HB2 uh, as part of the omnibus bill of HB2. It was not a separate bill incorporated later. It was originally in it. Can I ask a clarifying question? Representative O'Brien. Was that, was that in the, was that, did that come across in the governor's budget? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, a uh, question for you. Can we ask Jennifer to get that provision, or maybe the whole section of HB2 that pertains to this? That may be helpful to uh, some of the questions that have been asked yeah, Jen, about the sunsetting and all of that. Jen, could you copy that section of House Bill 2 relative to the FRM and make it available? Send it an email. Okay. Good. Representative Almy. Mr. Chairman, and uh, there was an original uh, FRM fund law, which I think a uh, HB2 was modifying, so maybe we need that piece of it too to understand what we're looking at. I think we need to look at HB2 in order to be able to identify it and look at it. And then we would go and, and look for the rest of the right. law. Right. Okay. It's like tracking the statute. One refers to another one that refers to somebody else. Okay, I don't see any other hands up. Thank you. Should be an interesting work session on that next week. The next. is House Bill 1524, establishing a National Service Alumni Attraction and Retention Fund. Mr. Chair. Representative Schoenberg. Uh, I got the uh, honor of looking at this. Well, I volunteered for it, sorry. But uh, just a quick summary. This bill only creates a fund for depositing of American Rescue Plan monies, grants, or donations. It does not determine how much of the recovery, how much of the resources of the $584 million that's still out that's coming to the state will be used. It creates a fund that can allow grants to be matched dollar to dollar for employers and for colleges, and no, it will be at no additional cost to taxpayers. New Hampshire taxpayers, but if there are questions about the setup of just the fund itself by this committee, uh, I think we should invite uh, Gretchen Stallings, the Executive Director of Volunteer New Hampshire, and Steve Epstein, Volunteer New Hampshire Board Chair, uh, to attend and give uh, their expertise on why this creation of this fund is so important for workforce 
development. Uh, this is a first bill that's going to go to a second bill will go to, I think, the Finance Committee, or I do not know, Mr. Chair, where it's going next. It's Why it came here, I do not know, other than we're just asked to create a workforce fund, an alumni re workforce fund. It's not going to another committee. It, it is not going to another committee. So it's just going to be this committee to either create or not create. Reps and Allen. Thank you. I think it's coming to this committee because we're in charge of dedicated funds. Right. Uh, but um, one of the key aspects of this for me is to try to get Treasury or someone to tell us how much money is sitting there in ARPA for New Hampshire that is on could be used for this. Apparently, there's a section in ARPA that is for um, for exactly this kind of thing. And I think the money hasn't been, maybe you know. There that. are seven, seven categories or eight categories under ARPA, and workforce development is one of them, and $19 million went to that portion, but only 400 and... Ten million has been spent out of the four hundred ninety-seven million that came in on the first round, and there's the rest of the money is coming in May of this year. So, uh, how they divide it up, I do not know. So, Madam Chair, I mean, uh, Ranking Member Almy, <laughs> that is the answer on that one. I yeah. Treasury might be a good answer. Yeah, I think. Treasury could help us because we're never sure when we're looking at these things also what the date on them is. You represent Schoenberg. Would you send me the names of these people? Yes, sir. I'll send them to you. Further questions? Yeah. Representative Brunson. Yeah, but this has been a question of mine. Uh, you know, I was involved with uh, one of three people in Rockingham County to come up with our plan to spend 60 ish money, million dollars. We came up with our plan completely, submitted it to the Treasury, and we've already got half the payment. I guess there were a lot of towns and so forth, uh, counties have gotten their money. Uh, I, to me, it's a puzzle as to what the plan is of the state, the complete plan. Um, that would be of interest. Um, and I'll take your word for it, Representative Schomburg, I always do, that this is, uh, maybe Representative Romney as well, that this does fall under the guidelines of the Treasury, U.S. Treasury, in terms of um, legitimate way of, of spending that money. So, but I, I really have no idea what the state plan is and whether there's money to, additional money that's out there that we, we can uh, work with. So thank you. That's just a statement more than anything else, Mr. Chair. I, I would like to know that too because Everybody's saying it's going to come from ARPA. It's going to come from the feds. Representative Almy. Sir Chairman, I don't know if we could get Gopher to talk with us. It's the, it's, I was thinking of the New Hampshire Treasury, not the Fed Treasury, trying to talk to the Fed Treasury. It's kind of hard. Uh, but, um, but Gopher is apparently the one that is handling all of this still, and and um, maybe they could explain some of this to our committee because it's also relevant to our revenue estimates for it. That's a good point. Further questions, comments? We have our work to do on House Bill 1524. The last one, House Bill 1565, relative to the Opioid Abatement Trust Fund. What new information do we need? Uh, well, the, uh, Mr. Chair. Representative Brown. Uh, the plan sponsor uh, gave us all this morning an amendment he'd like to speak to. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Diana. Yeah, the, the prime sponsor, um, Aaron, uh, Representative Aaron, uh, gave us an amendment this morning, and plus a, some of the chart here 
that you'd like to speak to uh, at our uh, next work session on this bill. I think we give it a courtesy for that, Mr. Chair. The prime sponsor here. Morning. Thank you, committee members and um, Chairman Major. So this morning I presented a um, an amendment to this bill to address some of the questions that were directed to me during the hearing. And, um, and one that's of the, the amendment O one two nine H. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So basically, what I uh, what I did was to clear up some of the language having to do with the uh, allocation factor and how the, the the calculation is clearer in this amendment um, because the original bill had some language in it that seemed kind of a little wasn't clear as to what the calculation really was. So uh, I, I fixed that in there. Um, and I also added uh, some of the items that were in the Senate bill. Uh, there's a companion, there's a Senate bill that also uh, changes some language in the, same stat in, in the same statute having to do with the opioid abatement trust fund. So what I did was um, I added in what Distribution of the funds should be based on the most recent decennial census instead of the 2020 census. So we don't have to go back and change that ever. Um, of each qualifying county and political subdivision that joined the national litigation prior to September 1st, 2019, according to the following formula. So the formula is the distribution shall be calculated by multiplying the settlement amount by the population factor and the allocation factor, where the population factor is derived by dividing each qualifying county's and municipality's population by the state's total population. And the allocation factor is set at 40%. So I also gave you a, a spreadsheet that shows you uh, what the change in the uh, fund can would you, be. Can you Sorry. say, are you reading? Are you referring to the amendment? And yes. And what yes. part of the amendment? That is um, in the first part uh, for section two. If, if section Chair, it'd be helpful if she gave us the lines. You have the can, line number. Line four. Yes. Thank on you. On page, page one. Point one. Eleven and fourteen. Thank you. Yes. Sorry about that. So if you look at the spreadsheet that I also um, distributed, you can see the, um, what the population factors would be in uh, E, as in column E. Um, column F is the factor that's used now. Um, and as you can see in column H, in column I shows the difference between what the current distribution was and what the settlement distribution would have been uh, with this uh, new allocation factor in place. Okay. <laughs> so with the, with the current the way the current allocation formula works is in column H, say for example, um, Belmont received $2,315.68, but with the new allocation factor that this bill proposes, they would have received $6,175.14, and that would go for their opioid treatment programs. 
So this, the, the new allocation factor also take, it, it removes this population penalty that we talked about during the hearing. So column H is current. Column H is the current. Uh, this is one distribute. This is one settlement, the McKinsey settlement, and the um, the settlement distribution in column H is what was distributed from that settlement. Had this bill, HB 1565, been in effect, the column I would be what those entities would have received instead. And as you can see, it's significantly more money. But yet, we're still leaving a million two hundred ninety-two thousand eight hundred twenty-nine dollars in the fund, which is a significant amount of money. So if any other municipalities wanted to apply for grants for, from this fund through the Opioid Commission, then you know there's certainly a, a, a nice pool of money for these other municipalities to draw from. In the meantime, what's happened is, so the total settlement was $2,762,394 from the McKinsey settlement. And um, only, uh, what is it, 414, what is it, I guess, uh, Two million three hundred and four, two million three hundred forty-eight thousand thirty-five uh, dollars was um, distributed out. I'm sorry, that's what's left over. Yes, so you can see that there, the opioid commission is sitting on a lot of money that could have been distributed out to uh, the entities that could have used it right away, and instead it's just sitting there. But anyway, um, so that that's um, part one part of the um, amendment. Um, the other part of the amendment adds in um, the part where it says the county nursing home supervisor or designee. Of, that's is it's page two, line five. County nursing home supervisor or designee appointed by um, the New Hampshire Association of Counties instead of the governor. And um, we're adding in another um, in lines 13 to 16 that we're supporting evidence-based prevention programs and services, including efforts to promote healthy drug-free lifestyles, reduce isolation, build skills and confidence, and facilitate community-based prevention efforts. So basically, this amendment is just cleaning up uh, some of the Calculation language. That's really the, the major thrust of this. Questions? Representative Helmer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, um, our chair likes to have engineering diagrams that, that show where the money is going. And I think that this would be a big help for a lot of us. This boxes saying, okay, the money, this is the money that came in from the settlement on this portion went to the advisory council, this went to each town by this formula and would go by that other formula. On this money goes to each county. Uh, on, and I think that would make it a lot easier to try and follow this. Um, but also, the way I look at it, the towns, the one town and 12 cities that signed on to this agreement, which mine didn't because they have the same theory I do of this. Um, it turns out, I found out, um, they, on are, um, they are triple dipping. They get the money from the count, their money from the county, they get their own money, and then they can, can go after grants. And every other town in the state 
who also is having major opioid problems uh, is getting one dip instead of three. And um, believe me, my town has major opioid problems. But our city manager saw it, signed that handshake, with whoever was on it. I don't know, but he was. Um, and he uh, felt that the neighboring towns around us also have major problems, which is true. And the town, uh, the major, uh, just about every town in this state has to be touched by it. Um, it would, it would be nice if we could get uh, somebody from the opioid abatement uh, management, whatever that group is called, um, the advisory committee to talk to us about what they're doing and why they haven't done much yet, if they haven't done much yet, um, and what they're planning on doing. Because we're kind of dealing out a statewide approach to this, and it'd be nice to know what we're exchanging it for. Mr. Chair, <coughs> if I may, may I request that uh, our, our uh, County Manager from Sullivan County come and talk about the issue of double or triple dipping so that he can clarify that Maybe that may not be the, the case. Maybe we can. Okay, we'll do it right now. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Derek Furlan, the Sullivan County Manager. I guess in response to the, the perception that there could be triple dipping, um, I can speak for Sullivan County and say that with the programs that we run at the county, they are completely distinct from whatever programs the city of Claremont, um, which is in Sullivan County, uh, would use these funds for. So the city of Claremont will not be accessing the funding that Sullivan County would receive. So there's no double dip from that perspective. As far as whether or not the city of Claremont may or may not, or even Sullivan County for that matter, take its distribution and still apply for grant funding, well, that's a matter for each entity to decide based on the programming that they have. Uh, obviously, that process is separate, and the, the commission is establishing the rules about how entities might apply for those funds and whether or not they would factor in um, whether they whether that entity already received a distribution or is one of the entities that was not part of the of the uh, litigation, but that's really up to them. Uh, I guess it would all be needs based, or at least I would suspect it would be in part uh, needs based. Uh, as we mentioned during the testimony, the decision to join or not was a very very low threshold. Uh, each entity had to make its own mind up as far as whether they wanted to join, and they had about a 15 month window to do so. So, I don't know that any of the 23 entities should be necessarily penalized because of the other subdivisions that decided not to join. But the issue of double dipping, I think, is is um, is really a non-issue because each county has its own programs that they need to support and fund. Whether or not they would partner with either nonprofits within the county or even the municipalities is, is, a, is I think, a matter that's best left to them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is it not true that th the way you're doing this, the city of Claremont's population gets included in the county population in doing uh, what we've got is 100% of the state population getting money out of, out of this distribution, and then uh, 13 municipalities getting separate money out of this distribution, and all of it has to add up to another 100%. So, um, and as I understand it, it's requiring that the city of Claremont or the city of Belmont or whichever, uh, be in, their population be included again in the waiting for the county. 
It's included in the county's weighting and it's included in its own city weighting. Yes, Representative Almi, that, that's essentially the population penalty. That was as, as discussed earlier, um, the original legislation essentially deducted municipal populations from the county shares. And because we each have our separate and distinct um, opioid abatement programs and activities, um, that was one of the things that we sought to remedy with this proposed legislation because Sullivan County's programs um, do include a lot of people from the city of Claremont. It's, it's relatively proportional with our inmate population. Therefore, the, the, the drug abuse programming that we offer um, needs to account for that population. If it was deducted, uh, but the city of Claremont's population is counted at 100%, well, they get the full amount for their programming, and the county share is, you know, we thought, unfairly reduced by that population. Again, that's why we had to change the math and the formula, which I think was simplified with the amendment. Um, but, the, but the premise was this population penalty is, is, is punitive in that it only affects the counties. But the counties have their own programs that are separate from the municipalities. Follow up? Follow up. Thank you. But this is a population penalty, isn't it? On only if you accept, we accept the, your conclusion that you are the forefront of the opioid problem in New Hampshire instead of the opioid problem being universal across New Hampshire and affecting places like Littleton. And I presume, Sa I don't know, did Salem sign up for this? They're not, only cities seem to have been approached. I think Salem is outside of this too. I can't speak to who was approached. Like I said, there was a 15 month plus window. Um, I think it was, the information was, was publicly available. Um, I don't know that I'm not, I'm not going to make a value judgment about whose programs are more important. I can, I can simply state that from a dollar perspective, uh, the programs that we run in our county jail, uh, very confident that they would dwarf whatever the municipal programs would be. Um, whether it's medical, medically assisted treatment, uh, the clinicians and the case managers that we have that actually provide, um, the, the in-house treatment services on a daily basis, those are expensive. And um, I think it, they're all important. I think the front lines are in multiple um, locations, whether it's in a city, a town, or even a, a county. Um, but there's no denying that the county programs are significant and they are costly. And I just think that the uh, fixing this population penalty, as we've dubbed it, um, is a critical component. And I think it's a fair and reasonable way of, of um, distributing these funds to have the biggest impact most directly and uh, in an efficient manner. Any further questions? If not, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. If you have any other questions, please uh, feel free to contact me via email. Fine. Appreciate it. Mr. Buffetti, do you have anything to say? Can you clarify the, uh, the triple penalty issue? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm happy to do that. And uh, I should also say that I'm a member of the commission, the Opioid Abatement Commission, to the extent that there are questions about <clears throat> the process and where we are, I'm happy to uh, answer those. Um, for the record, my name is James Buffetti. I am an Associate Attorney General. So um, the, the population penalty that, that, that they just referred to, I would actually call it a double counting of people. So if you look at the original bill, <clears throat> um, you don't want to count people twice, because that gives an unfair advantage to those counties that had more political subdivisions who, uh, who joined because otherwise you can't get to 100%. So for example, Hillsborough County, both the city of Nashua and the city of Manchester um, hired contingency fee counsel and filed lawsuits. So if you did this distribution formula and you did not deduct the population of Manchester and Nashua, 
then you would count those people twice because you would count the population of Hillsborough County total, and then you would and then you would give them um, per person uh, some distribution formula. Fifteen percent is what the is what the current law says. And then, in addition, you would count them again to give an additional 15% by population to Nashua and to uh, Manchester. So those counties that had bigger communities who filed uh, lawsuits, th those, those, those populations of those communities were deducted from the counties to be fair to everyone else in the state. It's not... Uh, it's not a population penalty, it's, it's a protection against double counting people. So some counties, like Rockingham, Rockingham only had a couple of communities that, that uh, hired contingency fee counsel to file these lawsuits. Uh, so if you look at, in that first distribution for that McKinsey settlement, the, the county that got the most money was Rockingham because um, they had only a few communities in the, I think it was just Derry and Londonderry in the entire county of Rockingham that filed. All the other political subdivisions in Rockingham County, including Exeter and Plastow uh, and, uh, and any of the other communities who didn't file, because they didn't, they wouldn't have qualified for that 15%. So the county ended up actually benefiting because there were fewer communities that had uh, had had hired this council and filed these lawsuits. And, and I'm, I'm happy to speak to the to this issue about the, the work of the commission if that's uh, helpful. I know uh, Representative Balmy had questions. Uh, Representative Brown, I, I don't know if this is a question for you or for the uh, prime sponsor who handed out this chart. Do, have you seen this chart? I have not. Okay, um, maybe helpful if he did. I, I, I guess I want to make sure. The grand total of population is 1.3, 256. Uh, I, all I want to know, and again, maybe it's not a question for you. If I can ask, to, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, just to clarify this. So let's take the Hillsborough example and, um, and Manchester. So when we have the Hillsborough population 2010 census in this chart, is that really the Hillsborough census, or is it the Hillsborough census minus Manchester, and, or in any other uh, town that could be in Hillsborough here? So oh, I, would, I, I would have to look at this chart and compare uh, it to the chart that we use for the distribution. I don't think, I, I'm not sure I have one of those with me. Um, I could certainly get that to the, to the committee. Fine, um, we'll, we'll be having a work session okay. next Wednesday. Okay. Um, and I right. could I could certainly provide that ahead of time, um, which shows uh, so it shows the ch my chart that shows the population of each county uh, based on the 2010 census, and then it shows the populations of those subdivisions that had filed these lawsuits, and it deducts that, and so then you get two figures you get the the the, the starting figure the for the population of Hillsborough County, and then you deduct. Manchester and Nashua's population, and then you get the, the population figure for the remaining part of, of, of Hillsborough that is used for the distribution formula. Okay, which, which seems reasonable. Uh, I would, Mr. Chair. Fine. Uh, so well, I guess we have to ch check the numbers uh, with these new numbers to make sure that that's the case. But that's your position, though, that yeah, yeah, so it, we, we shouldn't double count. Right. Those. So the, the, the existing statute actually says that the, the population of any political subdivision that receives funds under the section shall not be included in the population of the county for determining the distribution of that county. That was put in precisely to avoid the unfairness of double counting. Thank you. Representative Tucker. Yes, I uh, live in Colas County, and I have been concerned, like all representatives have been, about the opioid crisis, not only in Colas, but in Grafton. And we have a major problem of not having any detox facility in Colas County. And the one that was supposed to have one in Grafton, uh, in the central part of the state, uh, doesn't either. So 
I need some money to talk about programs. But without detox, someone who has reached the decision that they're ready for treatment can't get into any of those programs. So I'd like really to hear that address. Does this include money for detox so that someone who believes they're ready for help can qualify? Or are you doing detox in the jails by just not having the drugs available? So um, if, if there were proposals for treatment facilities in different parts of the state that doesn't have a lot of treatment facilities, and Cross County is one, Sullivan County is another part of the state that doesn't, um, and there were proposals to have treatment centers. I, so it, in, in looking at the, the treatment, the long-term treatment of opioid use disorder patients, um, so detox is a, a very small part of it, but but it's key. But I, I'm not. Well, it's 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 key to a certain point, and I'm not sure that you need residential treatment. The science seems to indicate that a lot of this treatment can happen at at home in uh, in certain s situations. The most effective treatment for opioid use disorder is is medical assistance treatment drugs like Suboxone. Um, it's proven that because of the nature of an opioid addiction, which is not the same as other kinds of addictions, because it changes brain chemistry. So uh, opioids do something different to the person, and the, the addiction that is created is overwhelmingly powerful. I was a public defender for 14 years. I dealt with many, many clients who were addicted to opioids, many clients. And I would talk to them about what is this addiction like? And they would describe this craving that never goes away and that is so powerful, which is why oftentimes in opioid um, treatment, relapse is such an important part of it, it because it, it happens a lot. That craving never goes away. One of the most effective ways of doing it is through drugs like Suboxone. Um, and and uh, it's, so it's not just a matter of putting them into a a, a treatment facility without, oftentimes without this assist, this, this, this medical assisted treatment, um, it's not going to be successful. So that's the sort of stuff that we need to make sure we're providing access to, to everyone in the state. And so in some cases, th 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 there may be a need for transportation services for people who are having a hard time getting to a, a, a nearby uh, a, a treatment facility. And the, the, current, the current statute would provide that as an appropriate use of these funds. Um, you know, we, so in, in just in terms of this, uh, of, of where this is, this Opioid Abatement Commission, which is a wide-ranging commission made of, of state, uh, local, county uh, treatment uh, providers, uh, the, it's, it's a broad-range commission, um, we, we've successfully uh, approved rules. We did that uh, a few months ago. Um, we're now waiting for JELCA to act. It's scheduled, I think, for the next month or so. Um, yes, that has delayed uh, this this putting out the money. But um, but as an initial as as an initial first, figure out how how you can actually fairly distribute the money, and the statute re would would uh, would. Uh, require that. So we've done it. We've we've put together rules. They've been approved by the commission. They have been they have been uh, sent to Jelka. We're hoping that we get uh, uh, that approved so that we can distribute this money. Once those rules are approved, my expectation is that this money, as it comes in, will be going out on a really uh, on a fairly frequent basis. The rules actually say that when there's there's at least $500,000 in that trust fund that we need to invite grant applications so that we can start getting that money sent out. And so we have 2.3 million. I mean, frankly, it's, a, it's you know, somewhat of a frustration that it hasn't been able to go out before, but we have to work within the structure of law and the structure of government. And this is how we, we, we do thing in a, things in an organized way. Uh, so the expectation is that as we get money, and we're going to get money at least for the next 18 years, um, 
if this settlement that we're about to, to finalize with the three major distributors gets approved, then we should be able to turn this money around quickly, and it would be available to, to any political subdivision in the state, not just to those 23 political subdivisions who happen to hire contingency fee counsel uh, and, and file the lawsuit. And, and, and I can let, let me say this again. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a question of profound fairness here, right? These 23 subdivisions are now saying that they are entitled to uh, extra consideration for this money, up to 40% of the money, uh, because they were litigating subdivisions. That's the, that's the whole justification in the law. They were litigating subdivisions. They never litigated anything. Never, and so there is no dispute, there's no factual dispute that they never litigated anything. They filed complaints that went into federal court in Cleveland, Ohio. Those complaints have been, was stayed. Nothing happened to them. There was no litigation whatsoever. So how do you say that that justified them getting 40% to the exclusion of the other political subdivisions in the state that, that didn't? which includes, you know, Hudson and Merrimack and Bedford and, and, and Durham, and all of these towns that also have their own opioid problems, everyone, every political subdivision should have an equal say. Now, we agreed to give 15% to those litigating subdivisions as a compromise, but to increase it to 40% or more, I just think there's a, there's a question of fundamental fairness uh, and which is why we oppose the, the bill. Um, thank you very much. We can get into more details in the work session. We, we got, what I really want to do is, what is the kind of information that, what are, other information do we need? Uh, yes, Representative uh, Lasalas. Yes, uh, most of you don't know me. My name is Rich Lasalas. I represent the town of Litchfield in Hillsborough County. And just to follow up on Representative Tucker's uh, uh, question, uh, it's my understanding that uh, this, this spreadsheet is very heavily weighted toward population numbers. It's my understanding that the impact of opioids is not uh, evenly divided uh, across the state based upon population. That the actual prescriptions that were applied uh, are heavily weighted toward rural areas, which would certainly include uh, Coas County and some of the other rural areas. And the reason for that was that those areas did not have the availability of other less opioid heavily weighted pain. They didn't have, for instance, uh, physical therapy available to them. So opioids was prescribed more heavily than perhaps someone in my county of Hillsborough County. That's why, for instance, the state of West Virginia, which is a very rural uh, uh, state as a whole, has a tremendous opioid problem. So I would, and I don't anticipate being back here on the committee, but uh, I would ask that the committee members take that into consideration. And any time that that uh, monies are being divvied out to keep in mind that uh, Sullivan County and Grafton County and Coas County, the impact of opioids is, is more uh, horrendous in those counties, way beyond what a population chart would seem to suggest. So thank you for, for uh, that. Anybody else? Um, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question, and I appreciate your passion about 
the fairness of the distribution of these monies, which I think is critically important because from a clinical perspective, there is a lot of opioid, opioid addiction that is not even, a, we are not aware of. So because you filed a suit does not mean that you have a, a greater proportion of people addicted. So my question to you in preparation for next week, do you have available to you a breakdown geographically through the state of the numbers of cases of patients or people involved with opioid addiction? Because it goes beyond just the population numbers that you're referring to. It also goes to specifically getting the dollars to those that deserve it and need it. And so it would be helpful for us to understand exactly the distribution throughout the state beyond 23 entities. Thank you for your question, Representative. I, I, let me talk to, uh, to somebody at DHHS, um, and, and they have folks that are doing that. I don't know how much of that is reported so that the state would have access to the number of patients who are reporting substance use, but they may have some sort of geographical data that m may be, be helpful. Um, but, but, so, but that's exactly why th this, the current system, which has not even yet been, been put into place, um, that's why it's so effective, because it, precisely because it, 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 can, it allows us to address the needs in other se sections of the state that are not affected by population, and so that the commission can say, well, you know, there are problems in Sullivan County that, that need to be addressed. Their, their needs, uh, because of lack of, of, of treatment resources, for instance, may be greater. We need to take that into consideration. Even though it's a smaller county, we need to take that into consideration. And it allows the commission to direct the funds in, in ways that it's going to have the most effect for, for the people of New Hampshire to address the opioid crisis. Follow up, Ms. Kelly? No follow up. I, was, I would appreciate that because I have asked the hospital association and because they really don't have the ability to dig down deep into where all the patients come from in their catchment area. It would be helpful if DHHS had some more accurate um, numbers about the distribution or the, the, the spread or the, the where these patients or where these people are. I, w I will certainly ask uh, Thank and you. provide whatever I can. Thank you. Any further questions? Representative Allen? Just Representative very Allen. brief sequel to that. On, they may have numbers only by hospital, and my hospital will be seeing people over a wide area. So that would not be helpful. Thanks. Rep Representative Bromley. We're talking about RSA 126 uh, col uh, A colon 84. So what I just want to make sure I understand. This is what created this commission. It's it's actually eighty it's sections eighty three to eighty six. Okay, but eighty three yes. to eighty six. Yes. Okay, you got a follow up, Mr. Chair. Follow up to Justice Chair. So, in that original statute, was was there any formula prescribed, or the formula was supposed to be prescribed by the the commission? No, it's so it's in actually the formula is in one twenty six a eighty three section two, which has the formula. Um, about how the 15% would be distributed to those litigating subdivisions, uh, and it mentions the 2020, the 2010 census, and it has that language that I talked about about right. not double counting. So, in the chart that we were handed, that would be the McKinsey settlement. First, are we just talking about McKinsey settlement, or going forward other settlements? So, this would apply to all settlements that came in. McKinsey is the first. Uh, and only at this point settlement of, of opioid funds that the states received. So there was that 15% distribution that, that my office made to those litigating subdivisions under the statute, and then the remaining money um, is in the opioid uh, abatement trust fund. Okay, so, but, th but there will be, um, there will be uh, settlement funds, I predict, coming in for at least 18 years, uh, over different periods of the time over, over those years, uh, and you know, upwards of 150 or so million dollars that will come into the state that will be used and has to be used for opioid abatement purposes. Okay, and Mr. Chair, so, that, so then that 15% would apply to those counties or, 
or towns or cities that signed on to the any other future litigation? Yes. It would. Yeah, and yeah, so and it, they didn't sign on to anything. What they did was they, they agreed to hire contingency fee counsel, national contingency fee counsel, who filed on their behalf lawsuits. All those lawsuits went to federal court and were consolidated in the federal uh, court in Cleveland. Okay. So th they haven't signed anything. They just hired national counsel to, to file these lawsuits on their behalf. Okay, and, and this one more, this is read a final. So what's before us is a bill that wants to, for the McKinsey settlement, push, nope, for all settlements, push it above the 15%? Yeah, so uh, th that, so that, that the, 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 the McKinsey money was already distributed under this current formula. Right. So any, f any settlements, any, any settlements to come into any entity in the state, any, to, to the state itself, to any city, town, county, has to go into the opioid trust fund. Before that, then a certain percentage would be given to the litigating subdivisions. And so essentially, the bill in front of you would say, we're gonna, we're gonna change it from 15% to, I think, I have to look at the latest draft, to 40% of that would go to those, just to those 23 subdivisions that hired outside counsel to represent them. Okay, now I'm clear, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? If not, uh, this will even make it more juicy or come Wednesday. Can I ask what, what, what time is, is your work session? That's at 9.30. Okay. And, uh, okay. We may not go in numerical order. Okay. She put 9, then 9 o'clock. All right. Um, that closes the work session on all, the, all of our bills. No, that, that's good.